hello, Facebook community. I'm Ashling Knight, Digital Content Manager at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and I'm coming to you live here from the North American CF Conference in sunny Orlando. Today, I have the pleasure of kicking off the very first of three community sessions that we're going to be broadcasting live over the next three days. Uh, today's session is called Exercise and You, and we'll be talking to uh, three experts in the field of exercise uh, who've come all the way to us from Canada. So uh, first, we have Dr. Larry Lands here, director of pediat the Pediatric CF Clinic at Montreal Children's Hospital, McGill University Health Center. We have Ms. Blythe Owen, a physiotherapist in the CF Clinic and Division of Respiratory Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and Dr. Jane Snyderman, a clinical exercise physiologist at the Cardiopulmonary Exercise Lab in the Division of Respiratory Medicine at the Hospital for Sick Children. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, over the course of this discussion, we'll hear from each of these experts on the topics that they've devoted their life's work to. Uh, we'll also be answering your questions, so please feel free to post any of your questions under the comment thread below this video. All right, let's get this show on the road. So Dr. Lands, you're up first. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. And again, uh, if anybody is just joining us here now online, this is Exercise in You, the first of three community sessions that we'll be broadcasting live from the North American CF Conference over the next few days. I'm here with Dr. Larry Lands to talk about some exercise basics as they relate to CF. Dr. Lands, we know that exercise is important, uh, but can you tell us the benefits of physical activity specifically as they relate to people living with CF and uh, who can and should exercise? Okay, well, just think of some of the therapies that you do and think of a therapy that could markedly slow down the advancement of lung function, so by maybe a quarter, that you'd feel better and feel better about yourself and would help you live longer. This is what you will see from increased physical activity. And we studied this actually with our partners in Toronto and looked uh, at children and adolescents over a long period of time, over six to nine years. And those who were most active, regardless of their lung function, stayed much healthier than those who were inactive. Wow, wow that's quite remarkable. Uh, are there particular activities that may be especially beneficial to people with CF or ones that perhaps they shouldn't do? So most activities uh, are well tolerated. They may have to be adjusted for your particular uh, medical condition. That's where your CF team comes in handy. Mm -hmm. um, but outside of uh, some extreme things like uh, bungee jumping, uh, skydiving, uh, most things uh, can, be, uh, can be well tolerated. Uh, you do have to take precautions. Those who might have a large liver or spleen will have to avoid uh, contact sports. And as I said, you may need to adjust the physical activity based on your, on your uh, condition to start with. But everyone can exercise and everyone can benefit from exercise. And so I'd imagine that uh, something that might help people uh, is doing something that they enjoy in terms of exercise, but are there any other tips or strategies that you'd recommend for successfully incorporating exercise into your daily life for somebody with CF? Well, um, this is where we use questionnaires to try and understand what are people's usual patterns of how their day is spent. And it's quite remarkable when you start looking through your day and, and recalling what a weekday was like or a weekend day was like, you often find that there was large periods of time that you weren't doing much, or maybe you're watching uh, YouTube videos of uh, puppies, but <laughs> you then, then had to find that you do have time. So um, I think it's important that we don't view this as a therapy or a prescription, but that this is something that we want to alter our lifestyle to live a, a healthy and active lifestyle. Okay. So I think reflecting back on where did my day go mm -hmm. allows you to understand it. Because we know that the lack of time or the unavailability of time is probably the major barrier why people aren't as active as they could be. Hmm. Are there ways uh, to keep yourself motivated? Like, Would you suggest doing something with friends maybe, exercising? I, th I think really, really that's it. You mentioned the fun factor and that's important. Mm -hmm. So I think people do need to do activities they enjoy doing. 
Usually it's a mix of activities. And most of us need somebody along uh, or a group of friends, whether it's friends or it's family, to just keep us going you know, on those days where it's just, I'll do it tomorrow. And that's where the, your friends and family <laughs> come in and, and get, keep you going. Exactly. That's great. Uh, so if, in terms of, though, for people with CF, if they're exercising with their friends, are there any like precautions that people with CF should be taking into account when it comes to exercise, like any other? So um, certainly you do want to take um, uh, awareness of the environment. So if it's really a hot and humid day and you have trouble on those days, those are the type of days that you might want to alter it for an indoor activity. Or if you're in an area where there's happened to be high pollution and it happens to be a high pollution day, you might want to, want to back off. Um, it's important, and we'll talk about it a little later, that people hydrate uh, and they replace their salt because mm -hmm. we know that cystic fibrosis patients lose five times the amount of salt as somebody who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so just replacing the water isn't actually can make you feel not well because your salt level in the blood will go down. So it's important um, to take precautions like that. But other than that, generally, things uh, can be done uh, as tolerated. And so in terms of replacing salt, do they need to make any other adjustment, adjustments to their diet when incorporating exercise in? So all of us, when we're more active, we're going to burn more calories. So we definitely need more calories. Mm -hmm. um, but also, if we're trying to build muscle, muscle is protein. And cystic fibrosis patients don't absorb protein as well, but also mucus. Mucus is what's called a glycoprotein, so it's a protein. And so CF patients produce a lot of it, and they're just throwing it away. Mm -hmm. So for them to uh, put on muscle mass, um, not only do you want to do exercise using strength maneuvers and things like this, but you also need the protein to be able to build up that muscle. So very often, uh, patients will need a protein supplement or an adjustment of the diet. And again, that's where the CF team can come in handy. Wonderful. Uh, and it looks like we do have a question from the online audience. Would yoga or a treadmill give you a better workout? That's from Lori White. That's a great question. And I'm going to say it's going to give you a different workout. As a matter of fact, we're just starting a study using a home-based web-based yoga program so because we know that CF patients can't necessarily exercise as a group together. Um, I think yoga provides a lot of core strength and it provides a lot of uh, flexibility and mobility. I also look after adults, particularly after lung transplant, mm -hmm. and I'm impressed at how stiff they are. And I think yoga can be something that can be readily incorporated. It also provides breath control um, and major core strength. So I think yoga should be done. The treadmill is a great aerobic exercise. If you enjoy that type of thing, um, then you should do it. You may want to do other type of aerobic activities mm -hmm. and, and mix it up so that cause the treadmill might wear off yeah, in terms might of get, get a little get boring. old after yeah. a while. Yeah. Well, yoga can certainly, uh, in my experience, give you quite a workout too, which I hadn't realized <laughs> that I could just be out of shape. No, but. if you, if you uh, uh, I, oh, just one point, um, I would avoid hot yoga. Oh. Um, it's, uh, I don't think it's going to add anything, but it certainly would cause a lot more sweating and a lot more mm -hmm. problems with, uh, with salt. So I, I definitely uh, would avoid, avoid that. But there are a lot of sessions that do... Uh, uh, aerobic yoga, and yes, it definitely is a major workout. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Thank you for uh, confirming that for me. <laughs> it's not just me. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Lands. We're going to be moving over to our other guests today, but we'll be coming back to you, of course. So we have Dr. Schneiderman and Miss Owen with us. Thank you both for joining us here. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, for anyone who's just joining us on Facebook right now, uh, this is Exercise in You, the first of three community sessions that we're hosting live here from the North American CF Conference. Uh, we just finished chatting with Dr. Larry Lands about some exercise basics as they relate to CF. Uh, and now we're going to be speaking with Jane and Blythe to dig a little bit deeper in th into the different types of exercises and what they may look like at different stages of your life. Uh, after this, we will be answering some questions, so please post any that you may have in the comment thread below this video on Facebook. 
Jane. Okay. Hi. Let's start Hello. with you. Thank you again for okay. joining us. Our pleasure. Uh, so what is the difference between physical activity and exercise? Well, physical activity and exercise often get thrown into the same lump. And really, we like to differentiate the two. Uh, we like to show the difference. Physical activity, when it's done regularly, uh, becomes a habit. And that's really what we're looking for. And we call it habitual physical activity, or HPA. And what that means is that activity is just incorporated into your daily life, looking for lifelong activities, appreciation of activity. Exercise, on the other hand, is quite structured. It's more formal. It's repetitive. And it has as its goal to improve fitness. So really, we need both of these things, but we're going to differentiate them based on something that's just part of your everyday life and something like exercise that you actually go out of your way to do to improve your fitness. And uh, Blythe, many people, uh, from what I've heard, I've spoken to many people with CF, uh, and I know that many people do use exercise as a means of airway clearance, uh, but can aerobic exercise be a replacement for airway clearance? That's a great question. I think um, aerobic exercise should be used as an adjunct to airway clearance techniques. There is some evidence to show that moderate intensity exercises can increase the ventilation within the lungs. And so when you have different air velocity movements, that can help to shear and decrease how thick the mucus actually is. Um, in so doing, unless it's actually done for 20 minutes at a time and you're adding things like huffing and coughing and expectorating that mucus, um, it really shouldn't be a replacement, but more so as an adjunct. And the other part to remember is that generally people are doing their airway clearance two to three times a day to do their airway clearance. And so it must be done every day for 20 minutes. And if we're going to compare it to airway clearance, then maybe even two times a day for 20 minutes at a time with the huffing and coughing. I've seen people combine their mucolytic mm -hmm. therapy with aerobic type of exercise because they're breathing deeper, mm -hmm. maybe getting a little better penetration. Mm -hmm. So combining... Mm -hmm together, as long as they do the huffing and coughing, mm -hmm. could be actually oh. quite beneficial. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Uh, I would imagine that also as people with CF age, uh, they would need different amounts of physical activity. So Jane, perhaps you can explain uh, how physical activity does vary by age, uh, such as perhaps for a young child versus an adolescent um, versus an adult with CF. Uh, can you bring us through that? Okay, so we're going to look at four different age groups. So we have the young child from 1 to 6 years old, uh, the child from 7 to 11 years, the adolescent from 12 to 18 years, and the adult 19 and above. And we're going to look first of all at activity from those, each of those four different groups. So if we look at uh, HPA or habitual physical activity for the young child from 1 to 6 years, the recommendation is for 60 minutes per day of developmentally appropriate activities. So, in fact, physio for infants uh, and toddlers inc includes daily physical activity, uh, especially developmentally appropriate activities such as time spent in the prone position for infants to develop the trunk extensors and postural muscles. So for this age group, we're looking for activities that ha are, have a wide range. Uh, the kids of this age tend to move in high-intensity short little bursts, and that's what kids do naturally. Uh, we really need it to be fun. Uh, that's what little kids do, is they just have fun. Uh, involvement of the family, obviously, because they're the ones who are kind of taking care of the kids at that age. And really, we, our aim is to have physical activity be a part of treatment for CF at a, from a very early age onwards, from diagnosis onwards. Mm -hmm. Moving to the uh, child from 7 to 11 years, the recommendation is similar, 60 minutes per day. A variety of activities uh, must be enjoyable, and preferably as a family. So children with CF have reported lower levels and intensity of activity than their peers, uh, especially if they have moderate or severe lung disease. Uh, and yet, uh, if we ask them if what they think about physical activity, they in fact value it as much as kids without CF. So really what that means is that activity can be viewed positively. It's just how we represent it. So we want their, their habitual activity to be uh, intense enough that they feel like they're breathing harder than normal, and uh, we want that to affect their uh, airway clearance, to contribute to their airway clearance. Uh, again, enjoyable fun is really the key. Uh, it needs to not be continuous because kids don't do continuous, act little kids don't do continuous activity. Moving on to the adolescent. 
So now we're looking at the 13 to 18 years. Uh, recommendation is still 60 minutes a day, uh, including a variety of enjoyable activities. Still uh, involves the family, but now we're moving towards the peers and the friends because we know that that's what happens in adolescence. The time spent with peers becomes much more important. So it's a challenging time uh, for both parents and young adults. And uh, as Dr. Lyons pointed out previously, we have evidence showing that kids, over a, uh, kids with CF over a long period of time, six to nine years, uh, the ones who were increasing in their activity during that period of time actually had a slower rate of their lung function decline. Uh, so it's something that we really want to help them to incorporate into their daily life and carry on for life. Uh, so families really need to encourage outlets for physical activity as a routine part of CF care. Um, needs to fit in with their interests and their abilities. We also want to address fads and trends because we know that those are things that come and go and we really want them to understand what the benefits of those fads are, trying again to create more of a lifelong involvement. And we want to point adolescents to online CF peer groups uh, so that they can get more ideas and be participating together. And lastly, the adult group, so 19 years and above. Uh, recommendation changes a little bit now. It goes to 150 minutes per week or more, uh, preferably 300 minutes. And it's in involvement in a variety of activities of choice. So now the, uh, the idea here is that we know that uh, physical activity during adolescence often carries over into adulthood. So it's very important to try and get those habits ingrained at an early age and see them right through into adulthood when responsibilities increase and disease status changes. There's a very valuable internet uh, resource, uh, the Boomer Esiason Foundation, where there are examples of adults uh, who attribute regular physical activity as a key to managing their life with CF. So that would be really interesting for people to look into. Um, Again, physical activity has to be enjoyable uh, during adulthood. It has to be adaptable to changing health status, and it must fit in with a busy adult schedule. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Now, what about aerobic exercise? How does that vary based on age groups? Uh, okay, so now aerobic activity, we're thinking um, something that's continuous, that's really raising the heart uh, and, and the breathing rate, and something that is is done with the intent of improving fitness. So if we think of a young child, one to six years old, uh, clearly that's, there's not going to be a, a program in place because they, are, they cannot do structured aerobic activity. Uh, they also lack the development for anything continuous. So really the, uh, the, the goal here is to use a wide variety of activities and anything where breathing is increased and heart rate is increased. Um, and as they do develop their skills of walking and uh, 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 more kind of fine-tuned fine activities, they could be doing things more like running, hi uh, biking, swimming, as the, the idea is to encourage full body activity. Uh, aerobic activity, again, at this age is just uh, characterized by short bursts of, of activity, things like tag, high-level intense, but very short periods of time, and of course, family involvement is very important. Moving next to the child, 7 to 12 years old. Uh, so the recommendation here becomes a little bit more formalized to what we recognize, the 30 to 60 minutes of three days a week or more uh, to improve fitness. And it also includes up to 60 minutes per day of vigorous exercise, which can be helpful to meet the physical activity guidelines. So it's really becoming uh, more uh, formal and structured. Uh, intensity for this age group for a child 7 to 12 should be at least 140 to 150 beats a minute, which is about 70% of a predicted maximum heart rate, in order to see improvements in lung function and aerobic fitness. Um, again, taking a variety of activities, uh, we see the kids of this age group start to develop interest in trying out different things, a gymnastics club, joining a recreational soccer program, swimming, basketball teams, uh, an outdoor club. The key is variety. Um, participating as a family is always key. Um, it's a lot more fun if you're doing it with your siblings and mom and dad. Um, now, kids with CF will self-limit their activity due to coughing, and it's really important that we educate the teachers and uh, any kind of leader uh, that this does not indicate that a child with CF doesn't have a, a desire, but that's just a normal part of uh, living with CF. Frequent water breaks, uh, working with a dietitian to maintain we weight and uh, tailoring diet are both important. Moving to the adolescent, for aerobic exercise, recommendations are 30 to 60 minutes, uh, three days a week or more to improve fitness. And again, up to 60 minutes of vigorous exercise can be helpful to meet physical activity guidelines. So in adolescence, we know that there's a high risk of becoming sedentary. 
uh, our attitudes change. There's a lot more of this stuff going on. Um, if we can at all open the doors to opportunities of activities that might be interesting, especially if peers can involve themselves with uh, our patients with CF, that really becomes a lot more um, likely that they'll continue. So team sports involving training or conditioning uh, might appeal to some. Uh, again, very important for us to educate coaches and teachers about coughing because we don't want to discourage kids with CF from participating at high intensity exercise. Again, working with the dietitian to replace electrolytes due to excessive sweating. Uh, counseling on the benefits of aerobic exercise and the dangers of performance enhancing drugs is something that comes up during adolescence, which is very important for us to address. And how to resume exercise following an exacerbation. Uh, we know that a uh, period of times kids will get sick, or adolescents, all kids with CF will get sick, and we have to help them to get back onto their routine because uh, we all go through periods where we're going to fall out of our routine. Um, back to the adult now. So now we're 19 and above. Aerobic exercise recommendations are 30 to 60 minutes, uh, three days a week or more uh, to improve fitness, as well as up to 60 minutes a day of vigorous exercise, which can be helpful to meet physical activity guidelines. So complications of CF in adulthood uh, are often improved with aerobic exercise. However, we must consider uh, individuals uh, with severe lung disease, with severe malnutrition, with poor bone density, and joint pain, and CFRD, cystic fibrosis-related diabetes. So we have to make considerations and work with the CF team to tailor and customize exercise, aerobic exercise programs to take those factors into account. And of course, a slower approach to training will be needed for middle-aged CF patients. That's wonderful. Well, I know we want to hit on some of those complications a little bit later in our discussion. But before we move to that, um, Blythe, I, we've obviously talked about the aerobic and physical activity, but what about resistance or weight training? Um, what's the appropriate amount of resistance training for these different age groups? Well, certainly, resistance training is the use of a load to increase the amount of force from a muscle contraction. And you can actually achieve this through your own body weight, using weights or other forms of resistance, such as um, um, elastic bands and through the water. It is recommended for all children, adolescents, and adults, especially important for those living with CF. Some of the benefits include improving bone density to prevent complications like osteoporosis, really to increase the lean body mass, which is the amount of protein within the body improve their mood and overall quality of life, and to improve cardiovascular tolerance. Within the group of young children from one to six, there are no formal guidelines in terms of the types of um, resistance training. Really, it's to encourage normal gross motor development and strength, working on things like agility, balance, coordination. So again, making it very functional, fun, uh, family-oriented activities such as jumping, climbing, um, playing on uh, a playground structure, for example. When we get to the slightly older children, it is recommended that resistance training can be started as young as seven or eight when the kids have the cognitive ability to participate in those types of activities. And it would be recommended for two to three times a week. And so that pairs really nicely with things like um, aerobic exercise where you could be doing it daily and you have a bit of a break in between um, for the resistance training within a seven day week. Um, but uh, the types of ideas for a full body program for resistance training would include things that uh, would have multi-joint movements, really incorporate the large muscle groups uh, before you do include the small muscle groups, and using one's own body weight as the resistance. So some ideas would be like sit-ups, push-ups, um, planks for the really young kids, the wheelbarrows, maybe even older kids would like to do that too. <laughs> And when they're old enough, you can progress into free weights with some help and supervision, definitely mm -hmm. under the guidance of a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist. When they're a little bit older, um, you can um, go to activities called plyometrics, and those are the quick explosive movements. And that's part of the power training for different sports and activities. One thing to mention in older kids or in teenagers is really to start um, looking at um, activities to prevent postural changes. So to prevent the loss of range of motion, you might want to work on strengthening the shoulder retractor, retractors to prevent a rounded shoulder posture that can become quite common. And also adding activities that include weight bearing through the long bones and through the spine, again, to build up that bone density and prevent um, further complications down the road. 
There is good evidence to support aerobic and resistance training, even within a three-week program in an inpatient study that was done. It was shown that there were improvements in the uh, pulmonary function, the leg strength, as well as lean body mass. And it had an impact on the length of stay in the hospital, as well as decreased antibiotic use and overall quality of life. Some of the considerations in um, recommending resistance training would be to avoid things like breath holding or the Valsalva maneuver. Because you are using these muscles, you want to make sure that they're getting enough oxygen um, as you're working them. So definitely by holding your breath, you're going to restrict the amount of oxygen going to those working muscles. Um, sometimes with these types of exercises, it can also stimulate coughing. So one consideration would be to perf uh, perhaps perform your airway clearance before you actually engage in the resistant type of tr um, training. And definitely, as um, Dr. Lance had mentioned, nutritional intake must be closely monitored and work with the CF team and your dietitian to make sure that the caloric intake is sufficient to support all the activities and resistance training that you are doing. With adults... Um, it's also recommended for two to three times a week. And again, it should involve the upper, the lower, the trunk muscles, engaging the large muscles before the small muscles. Resistance training um, in adults has also, um, it's thought that it may have a similar effect on the FEV1 or your pulmonary function test compared to aerobic exercises. So why that is important is those with low bone density, um, they should avoid things such as twisting and turning and putting a lot of um, bouncing ballistic forces and movements through their bones um, so that they have another alternative to um, get the gains of exercise as well. Those with CF-related diabetes, definitely blood glucose monitor, monitoring should be done and working with the dietitian again and the CF team to get the nutritional advice to balance those calories. And one thing that I also do want to mention along with resistance training is to make sure that there's also the flexibility component with the mm -hmm. stretching. Mm -hmm. uh, now you've worked your muscle, you also have to do your cool down and stretch out those muscles to maintain that range of motion and, mm -hmm. uh, so that you don't lose any range of motion, especially you know, the large muscle groups, but as well as chest mobility that sometimes you know, talking to your team to make sure that that doesn't get overlooked as well. Thank you all. Thank you. It looks like we also have another question from online audience. Uh, what kind of exercises can someone do at home, and how do you tell someone you need a break when in class or at gym or at the gym? Benji Griffith. Who would like to take that on? Well, I can start first. I think the type of exercises that can be incorporated at home, um, I like to break it down kind of into three parts of having something aerobic, getting your heart going cardiovascular. So doing a 20-minute um, activity that actually makes you breathe a little bit heavier and sweat a little bit. It is important to do a little bit of a warm-up first to get your muscles going as well. Then there should be a strengthening component. And again, it doesn't have to be done all at once because if you were to do it all together and it ended up taking 30 to 40 minutes at a time, that could have been a barrier to doing regular um, exercise or habitual physical activity, um, but maybe to break it up. So number one, aerobic exercise, then adding some strengthening, and again, getting that flexibility component in there as well to make sure that you're also stretching out and maintaining the range of motion. So I'll try on the next one. Um, now, I'm, Benji, I'm assuming that when you say, how do you tell someone you need a break when you're in a class or gym, I'm assuming that someone might be a teacher, uh, mm -hmm. not just your friends. So hopefully uh, patients with CF have discussed uh, via their parents, uh, with their teachers, what their situation is. And I think it's a great idea if you let the teachers know, because uh, then they'll understand that coughing is just a part of CF and taking breaks periodically is very normal and helpful. And I think the key is to educate the teachers to mm -hmm. let them know that uh, that's your situation. Great. Well, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Blythe. Uh, if you are just joining us now, this is Exercise in You. Uh, again, the first of three community sessions that we will be broadcasting live from the North American CF Conference here in Orlando. I am joined by three experts in the field of CF and exercise. Dr. Larry Lands to my left. Dr. Jane Snyderman over there, and actually uh, Miss Blythe Owen, so went out of order, but uh, they're all wonderful. They've, we've been chatting for uh, the last, last few minutes, and now we're gonna get into a larger conversation around some of the complications 
um, and take some of your questions from online. So uh, we've been recently talking about how physical and aerobic activity varies based on your age, and now we're gonna discuss some specific situations uh, that may present additional complications or even require a change of your exercise routine. Uh, again, we'll then move on to the Q&A portion, so if you do have any questions, please post them under the video on Facebook in the comments section. Larry, perhaps you can kick us off uh, by talking a bit about what kind of adjustments might need to be made if someone lives in an area with heavy air pollution. So um, in heavy air pollution, um, really most people should not be doing vigorous aerobic exercise outside because if you're breathing more, you're going to be breathing in more of the pollutions. So and that would be a time to maybe say, let's switch it up, let's do an indoor activity. Uh, maybe in the house or maybe it'll be the pool as long as it's, the chlorine fumes aren't overly strong. So that type of, that type of thing. So um, you do have to be conscious of that, but it is, quite, uh, it is certainly doable. Um, I just want to mention, and maybe it's because we are in Florida, um, something that didn't come up is uh, scuba diving. Oh. And, um, unfortunately, scuba diving uh, is not for cystic fibrosis patients, but actually the recommendations are for anyone with lung disease, including asthma, they should not be scuba diving. They can certainly snorkel, but the marked change in pressures and all this is not something that unfortunately is, is for, uh, for CF patients. But I think um, many areas now will uh, post uh, pollution numbers uh, of the day, um, and I think people should uh, take uh, recognition of those and adjust their activities or the more where they're doing their activities for that day. Do you have any specific number that like they should vary based on or should they just consult with their CF care team? Uh, this is really where the CF team can mm -hmm. come in handy. Um, the CF team will have a good notion of their lung function. Uh, it's very possible they'll actually be measuring their exercise capacity. Uh, they might be doing that, you know, every couple of years. And so it allows them to give guidance on, uh, on what is tolerated, although very often we, as, a, as a simple guideline, um, we use a heart rate and how, and how breathless you're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, our, I happen to work in a lung transplant uh, group looking after uh, CF patients, and uh, we don't have a formal uh, in-hospital supervised exercise program pre-transplant. It's done at home, and people are given guidance about um, how to adjust their oxygen, but also how to judge how much exercise they were doing, and it's really based on symptoms and heart rate. Mm -hmm. And so how might uh, exercise vary for people who have perhaps something like CF-related diabetes or uh, enlarged livers or spine, or, you know, spine issues? Okay, well, so a large liver and spleen really spleen. means no contact sports um, because the spleen normally is nice and small and sits up under your rib cage and it's nice and protected, mm -hmm. but when it gets big, it's sticking out and it's a very squishy organ, basically like a big sponge. <laughs> so it's easy, easy to get uh, damaged and um, because it doesn't have a, a structure, it can get torn and bleed. Mm -hmm. So um, we really uh, want to avoid um, uh, those type of uh, activities. Uh, I mean, I've had people who didn't have that problem do a lot of competitive sports. Uh, I've had a girl who played on her high school football team to the age of 14. I've had, uh, coming from Canada, we've had a lot of hockey players. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, so this is doable, uh, but it, it just needs to be uh, looked out for and, and adjusted. Um, in terms of diabetes, it's more insulin adjustment. Uh, we all know that if any of us are <coughs> exercising, uh, we're going to be using up the sugar in our blood, and so our insulin requirements are lower. So um, there needs to be adjustment uh, of insulin dose, taking into account how physically active somebody's going to be at that time. Thank you. Uh, Blythe, how might exercise vary for people with CF who currently are being hospitalized for uh, pulmonary exacerbation or for those who are on supplemental oxygen? 
I definitely would advocate for those who are needing supplemental oxygen or if they're hospitalized for a pulmonary exacerbation to continue with exercise but as tolerated. So I would use measures such as heart rate or respiratory rate, signs of respiratory distress, or using different scales as Dr. Lance had mentioned to really gauge their workload. Um, and likely they'll see a difference kind of in the beginning of an admission toward and um, also towards the end. And so if someone comes in with a lower saturation, I wouldn't restrict them to not actually be doing, partaking in exercising and mobilizing. I really think um, to make sure that they're maintaining saturation levels of above 90%, and that might involve needing extra oxygen, um, that as determined by the physician, um, that would actually give them a little bit um, more means in terms of uh, being able to carry out more activities and exercise. Um, but it is important to allow for rest and recovery during um, these exercise bouts because their tolerance when they're sick or needing more oxygen may not be the same as mm -hmm. usually during their baseline. And one last thing to mention is that when somebody is sick or during a pulmonary exacerbation, that may um, increase the stress placed on the heart when you're actually exercising. So as the clinician um, exercising with a patient, I just want to make sure that I monitor um, their vitals very closely and you know uh, collaborate with the team. I just want to emphasize what, what Blaise said. Um, we routinely will substitute our midday physio session for hospitalized patients with an exercise session. Mm -hmm. And if they have to stay in their room, we bring the exercise mm -hmm. equipment to them. Oh, wow. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's been shown that you get a faster and better recovery. So it definitely is not a time to do nothing. Um, mm -hmm. You do have to adjust for their condition, but it's something that we do incorporate into, into hospitalization. Yeah. As well, back on the habit theme, if you can create a habit while in the hospital, hopefully yes. the key yeah. is to continue that habit as they go home. Mm -hmm. And one really easy portable piece of equipment is an exercise ball. You can have um, the person sitting on it, bouncing, you're getting an aerobic workout. But at the same time, all the jostling and the deep breathing that's happening, you're actually causing ventilation changes within the lungs and decreasing the viscosity or, again, the runniness of the mucus. And that actually, we, we do it together with the airway clearance. You can do stretching on the ball. You can use it as resistance to um, you know, stretch it up over your body as well. I just find it's such a simple tool that has so many universal and practical applications in and outside of the hospital. Nice. <clears throat> uh, so I know that exercise is very important pre and post transplant, uh, but can we maybe perhaps I'll talk a little bit about how that would change based on where you're at in that, in that process? So um, pre-transplant, and I, I actually advise all my patients they should look at the pre-transplant period as almost like going into Olympic training mm -hmm. because we know the better shape you go into your transplant, the faster your recovery mm -hmm. will be. So uh, it really, um, it's, it will pay dividends. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it's a good time to invest in yourself and really do those type of act activities. Uh, both strength, strength training and aerobic training. Mm -hmm. um, we know that those leg muscles just melt away uh, in the time when people are sick. And so it, it's good to have that all built up uh, beforehand. Post-transplant, there's a certainly a recovery period. Um, standard uh, transplant, the sternum is cut in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, it gets wired together afterwards. Doesn't really form solid bone till, uh, till about a year. So we have to be careful with uh, weight training for arm exercises in the first few months. This is where the physiotherapist attached to the lung transplant will give a graded progression. But certainly we get people quickly back doing things, walking, stair exercises are fantastic because mm -hmm. that's what people really notice the most, that it takes a while for those legs to come back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you guys have anything to add on to that? Either or Jean? I know at the Hospital for Sick Children, we do have a pre and post lung transplant program. Mm -hmm. So um, patients that are listed waiting for lungs, they actually do come to the hospital three times a week for the rehab program. Mm -hmm. And so those who live a bit further away, oftentimes we will work with community partners to try to be able to support and supplement the family if they're not able to come the three times a week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So obviously, 
to me, when I'm hearing about all of the different kinds of exercise, I'm like, this is a lot to take in, and I don't even have the you know, treatment burden. I don't have CF, so I don't mm -hmm. have that. Uh, I know that that takes a lot of time for people with CF, so uh, you know, you're talking about physical exercise, aerobic activity, weight training. How do you suggest that people work exercise into their already jam-packed schedules? So I think that um, this varies by family. Some families have it incorporated already as part of their daily life. Uh, for others, it's the CF patient themselves that just latches on to an activity that they're very excited about. But in general, for the majority, maybe, it's kind of has to be, we kind of call it sneaky fitness. So okay. sneaky fitness is almost like when your kids are young and you grind up vegetables and put it into something like making pancakes or soup and they don't really know <laughs> it's there. Well, I think there's something equivalent in terms of just habitual physical activity. You know, something as simple as parking the car a little bit farther away from the library where you can take your kids to take the library books out of. Or something like taking the stairs instead of the escalator and the, the, and the uh, elevator and so on. It's really just looking constantly for little creative ways on a daily basis mm -hmm. to just hide movement. It starts out as little movements and it grows. Whether it's capitalizing on the fun fact of um, doing these activities with your family members, your friends, adolescents, it's very important to get friends in. Adolescents love music, so we tend to gravitate towards music. Some kids dance up in their rooms. The music is blaring, they're just dancing. Heart rate is up, breathing is up. The key is to make it sneaky and not call it exercise, because a lot of kids don't want to do exercise, but they love to go play soccer. They love running after a ball but they don't want to run laps around a gym. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is to be creative and to just try and constantly be thinking outside the box in terms of everyday life. Sneaky fitness. Sneaky fitness. Trick or treating. Yeah. <laughs> right in time. <laughs> <laughs> right in time for Halloween. Uh, it looks like we do have some questions from our online audience. So uh, we've gotten a, a lot of comments about depression. So how can exercise help with emotional wellness? I'm really happy that that question was posed. Um, I just came from a meeting mm -hmm. and was discussing this with Alexandra Quitner, who is mm -hmm. the guru yeah. uh, on, uh, on quality of life and, and uh, feelings of depression and anxiety. And we have good evidence um, that being regularly active has a very positive benefit, no matter what your underlying condition is on both uh, depression and anxiety. It, it can certainly uh, certainly has a big benefit. So actually, we have a study going on now to try and increase physical activity, and one of our outcome measures are using uh, uh, scales to assess depression and anxiety. And we're expecting to see some of our biggest benefits uh, in that aspect. So um, strongly recommend for for those aspects of it. And I think this goes across the whole population. Um, yeah, we see Olympic absolutely. athletes, surprisingly, who have come forth and explained that they've, had, they've been battling depression, and in fact they find that their training for their sport is something that's helped them to get through it. Okay, we have another question here. As a person with low body mass, are protein powders beneficial to build muscle in CF patients while doing exercise? I hope I don't butcher this name. You, you see, you see me cruise. Thank you for your question. So I brought up protein earlier, and, and I'm a big fan of protein. Um, you have to be careful uh, which protein products you use, and this is where your CF team uh, mm -hmm. could come in handy. Um, but we know that uh, if you want to build muscle, you're going to have to increase your protein intake. Um, the general exercise field has suggested. Um, one of the optimal times to take protein is right after a vigorous workout. Mm -hmm. The body seems very receptive mm -hmm. to protein at that time. Um, as Jane mentioned, you do want to keep totally away from performance enhancing drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, they will not have any benefits and have potential long-term negative mm -hmm. consequences. Mm -hmm. um, you also have to be careful how much extra protein you can come in. So this is not something you should do on your own. I've had patients who say, oh, yeah, I did this, but, you know, since some more was good, then a lot more must have been great. <laughs> and actually, they got into problems. Too much protein can cause kidney stones, mm -hmm. right. uh, which are some of the most painful things that can happen to you. Mm -hmm. So you really use your team. The team mm -hmm. is there to help you with this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And can you give us some tips for working out when you have a pick line from Aaron Mark? Great question. Um, my experience working with uh, pick lines is that uh, you wouldn't want to do too much resistance training on that arm where the pick is coming out from, but in terms of doing aerobic and flexibility that is tolerated, um, that's what I would be most comfortable with. I don't know if Dr. Lance has anything more to add to that. No, I, I agree. Um, you know, the, uh, usually the pick line is very often placed sort of below the elbow, so you do want to avoid uh, over-flexing that. It could cause some kinking uh, in the pick line. Higher uh, Pick lines that are put higher up, they might give you a little more flexibility on it, but you want to be careful, certainly, on that size. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Looks like we have another question. Is it good to use your puffers before exercising from Pat? It depends. <laughs> if you have... If you have what we call exercise-induced bronchospasm, mm -hmm. in other words, that your airways get narrowed uh, with exercise, then you should use your puffers. If you don't, and many patients I know get puffers, but they don't necessarily need them, then they might not need their puffers. On the topic of puffers, can we review the correct way to use a puffer? Because I see a lot of kids use it on the fly and don't seem to be using it properly. Okay. Um, I used to think that you could use a puffer without a spacing device. Mm -hmm. um, I have watched <laughs> numerous people with their horrible technique. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you are using something with an aerosol, then you should be using it with a, with a spacing device. You may, though, and, and I particularly like this for uh, pre-adolescents and adolescents, is using dry powder formulation mm -hmm. because those are sort of easier to put in your pocket and, mm -hmm. and take on the flight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have another question online from Jenny. Is there more of a benefit to swimming in salt or chlorine pools? Okay. As an owner of a salt pool, <laughs> I can't tell you how fabulous a salt pool is <laughs> and how it's turned me off to swimming in a chlorine pool. Right. Um, it is much easier to breathe in, in, a, in a salt pool. Yeah. Um, uh, the the fumes can be, especially if it's an enclosed structure, mm -hmm. can be actually, uh, for many people, can be overwhelming and, and make and it irritant. difficult. Yeah, and an irritant. Plus your skin will come out all mm -hmm. nice and smooth. Uh, <laughs> salt, the salt pools are great. Um, not always available. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, once you swim in a salt pool, mm -hmm. it's hard to go back to mm -hmm. chlorine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But still, so chlor um, chlorine pools good over no swimming. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I just want to throw in a word of caution, hot tubs. Yes. Hot tubs are a no-no. Mm -hmm. The problem is the, the hot tub is obviously, it's hot water. Mm -hmm. And so you don't use chlorine, you use a bromine solution. Um, and because of the heat, they're just not as effective as cleaning the water. And um, there's well-known lung diseases, even with people without CF, mm -hmm. called hot tub lung disease, mm -hmm. uh, because there are certain uh, bacteria and fungus that just love to hang out at the hot tub. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and we have some, a question from Caitlin Rose. Uh, how would you suggest overcoming the difficulty of breathing when starting to run regularly? I can tackle that one. Yeah. So starting to run programs are exactly as they sound. Um, we actually want to intersperse walking with running. Uh, people create a goal for themselves to run a certain distance and they kind of get really uh, defeated uh, when they find that it's difficult to run. So uh, for example, the running room, uh, which is located in many different areas in Canada, I guess, I don't know about the US, um, they will create programs uh, indicating a walk run routine. So you walk a little bit, you run a little bit, walk a little bit, and you keep repeating this where your amount of time running increases and your amount of time walking decreases, and that helps you to uh, gain a longer distance in your running. And it'll be a lot more encouraging that way rather than just going out and running, as well as your soft tissue, the little uh, um, muscles and ligaments and tendons around your ankles and knees will thank you. <laughs> Great, and we, now we have uh, a question from Cindy, who is 63 years old. Any exercises for older CFers? First of all, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, 
Uh, I think Jane said it best, age-appropriate exercises. Um, and uh, there again, um, you want to maintain bone strength. I think it's very important. Uh, flexibility and strength, plus the aerobic training. Um, Jane, I'm not sure if you have other more specific things. Uh, I think the key is progression. Start off slowly, um, see what you can do, try and vary your routine, address all the different aspects of physical fitness, uh, your aerobic, your resistance, your flexibility, even your balance. And the key is to start very small and incre very small increments build up. Great. And Vanessa, a question from Vanessa, can you exercise with the G-tube button? Absolutely. <laughs> There's no problems with that. Short and sweet. Okay, well, uh, it looks like that is all for our uh, session today. So thank you to everyone who uh, wrote in your questions. Uh, for more practical information about living with CF, exercise, and other topics, you make sure you follow the CF Foundation on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, check out our CF community blog on cff.org. We're going to be having recaps posted every day from each of our plenary sessions. So be sure to check back on that and uh, hear what we found to be most interesting from each of those sessions. They'll, they will also be live streamed. Uh, we will be back on your Facebook feeds tomorrow and Saturday with two other great community sessions. There's going to be one session on community connections and partnerships. That session is tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, and we have another on how you can get involved in CF research, and that's on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So thank you all for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you online for watching, and that's all. Goodbye. <laughs>